Hi, this is Mike Regan, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to another edition of our On the Record, and we are delighted to have Darren Hawkins, the CEO of YRC Worldwide, join us for a discussion about uh, what's going on, not just in the LCL marketplace, but to update our viewers on some of the exciting things that have been happening in the YRC world. So, Darren, I'd like to welcome you to this On the Record here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Always glad to be with you and also uh, everyone that's listening. Great. Hey, you know, Darren, uh, let's uh, let's start it off. Uh, before we started uh, recording this, uh, we were commenting on the fact that 2020 has been an interesting year. Uh, can you can you help update us on, uh, you know, what's gone on over the past couple of months? I know some of our uh, viewers have, you know, asked me questions about the uh, your new investor in YRC and uh, some of the other things. So can you update us what what occurred and where we're at today? Yeah, certainly, Mike. Um, um, you know, there's never a boring year in trucking, and uh, 2020 uh, didn't let us down at all from that standpoint. There's certain dynamics going on that uh, I would like to touch on a minute, and I'll certainly touch on some YRC worldwide specific items. Uh, the first of which, uh, specific to the LTL industry as a whole, as you know, uh, typically our volumes start declining uh, after Thanksgiving and uh, we will hold employment uh, steady and, and allow attrition to help us work through those slower months. And then typically we start uh, very concerted hiring efforts uh, around Valentine's Day. Uh, this past year, uh, as you know, we went through the holidays, things were normal and uh, demand was recovering some from uh, uh, 2019. However, at the beginning of the year, right when we were planning to uh, ramp up our driving schools, uh, all the things that we normally do to make sure that, that we do the hiring around several thousand employees to be ready for the spring lift, we started getting the first hints of what uh, the coronavirus was really going to mean for the economy. There was a strong pullback and then once the entire economy shut down when typically we would be hiring thousands of employees, we were actually furloughing thousands of employees across the industry. Uh, not knowing how long that would last, uh, certainly those hiring efforts didn't um, uh, resume uh, through uh, the early spring. And then once things started improving somewhat in May, uh, I think every transportation company was behind the curve on hiring. Uh, since then, we've seen volume sequentially improve every month since May, uh, but we've seen the amount of CDL uh, driver certifications across uh, the, uh, all states uh, uh, go down. Uh, and then also um, current drivers in the industry that were close to retirement age, uh, I think just because of the events and and maybe even outside our industry, a, a lot of people decided to go ahead and pursue retirement just because of the uncertainty of everything that was happening. Uh, that, along with some pent-up demand that came out of uh, the shutdown, I think uh, is what's created this situation we're in right now, where there's capacity challenges across the United States in certain pockets, and also there's very uneven freight flows happening. So. I think that's kind of the state of where I see our networks and also from uh, the earnings season that we're just coming out of and hearing many of the publicly traded uh, supply chain companies talk about that. That's, that's the phenomenon that we're seeing right now. And I don't think uh, there's immediate relief in sight for that. Uh, naturally, we've got our driving schools open. Uh, we're we're full-blown recruiting just like we've done in the past, but literally, uh, you know, we're four months behind on that process, just like everyone else is, and uh, that's not going to remedy the situation anytime soon. Well, and, and just to support, I think what you were saying, <clears throat> uh, Derek Leathers, who you know quite well, we've also talked with on numerous occasions, he's the CEO of Warner, uh, indicated that the CDL number is, I think he said, down by 100,000 CDLs year over year. Yeah, and I would say across the United States, that's uh, uh, absolutely agree with that. Okay. All right. So, you know, uh, obviously, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the, the deal was announced with uh, your new partner, the U.S. government. Can you uh, walk our viewers through what's transpired? Uh, you know, one of the things when you were kind enough to be interviewed a couple months ago, 
you talked about, you know, YRC had been executing on their strategic plan uh, prior to COVID-19. Obviously, you know, for our viewers, one of the things we highlighted in a two-minute warning, Darren, was the fact that April, I think, was uh, the worst freight month in 26 years or something like that. And I think it's important for our viewers to understand just how hard the carriers were hit uh, across the board. LTL truckload volumes were down in April. They came, as you mentioned, came back starting in May. And, you know, now we're seeing, you know, relatively strong demand. But uh, help us understand exactly what's transpired with YRC worldwide. Yeah, certainly. Um, just as every company in the world was doing uh, coming uh, out of February into March, uh, as we began to uh, understand the impacts uh, of the invisible enemy, if you will, uh, in evaluating what action should be taken. Naturally, we went into uh, a li liquidity preservation mode, uh, uh, watching costs closely, all the things that you would normally do, but also as we looked at uh, specific plans for our company, um, the information around the CARES Act was, was starting to become um, well known at that point. Once that legislation uh, became uh, uh, into law from Congress and we read that legislation, uh, we thought that we had a good opportunity to qualify and naturally pursued that. As the portals began to open uh, through the CARES Act process with the United States Treasury, we applied, went through a lengthy due diligence process in providing all the information uh, that was asked for and fortunately, uh, we're successful uh, in that uh, effort and closed um, uh, that process on July 7th. So um, as uh, part of the deals call for, uh, the U.S. government becomes a 30 uh, percent shareholder in LRC Worldwide. Uh, we're honored uh, with this opportunity, uh, but this is really about 30,000 American families. Uh, these these 30,000 employees were deemed essential early on during uh, the pandemic, and uh, they continued coming to work every day, supporting the supply chain, making sure Americans had what they needed on a daily basis to continue their lives. And uh, I think uh, a lot of us, uh, and maybe even uh, me and others in the industry, took the overall supply chain for granted and how it affects us personally. Uh, I'm honored that our company not only is uh, a provider to the Department of Defense, the U.S. government, uh, Department of Energy, Homeland Security, uh, all of uh, the armed forces, but also uh, communities all across the United States. Uh, we're, we're an essential provider in getting people what they need. And I think uh, all of us realize during this time how important it is and also how fragile uh, the national supply chain can be uh, even in the United States, uh, the, the most modern country in the world uh, from that aspect. So um, I'm proud of our employees, the way they perform through the process. I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, that this has afforded us. Uh, naturally, we had deferred uh, some health, welfare, and pension payments during that time. Uh, all those um, um, are current uh, as we move forward. Uh, we're focusing on the customer. Uh, taking great care of the customer is why we're still here. That's why we're essential to the national supply chain. Uh, and that's what our 30,000 employees are focused on uh, moving forward. Okay, so uh, I believe, Darren, there were two tranches, if you would. Uh, the total value of the deal is about $700 million, I believe, in that range. Uh, yep. The first drawdown has occurred. I think it was $400 million. Uh, and you were it was mentioning that uh, a significant portion of that is going to go into uh, upgrading YRC's fleet. Uh, one of the things that was a little bit uh, eye-opening, uh, you know, for those that may not know this and it surprises them, uh, I'm a CPA. I worked for uh, Union Pacific for a year and Price Waterhouse, now Price Waterhouse Coopers, and was on the audit of transportation companies. But a lot of shippers are not aware of the issues, things like maintenance. And one of the things that surprised me in reading about this was the favorable impact that the modernization of the fleet's going to have on allowing YRC to reduce its cost structure. Am I on the mark with that? Could you kind yeah. of elaborate on that for a moment? Yeah, I'll just clarify on the two tranches. Uh, tranche A is a $300 million tranche, and that was to be focused primarily on the health, welfare, and pension payments that we had deferred. Uh, that piece has been enacted, and uh, when I mentioned those deferrals are current, uh, 
uh, that's uh, the process that we went through to do that. The remainder of that went into working capital. Uh, tranche B uh, is the second part that you were referring to. That's actually the $400 million part of the loan, and that's to be focused uh, only on tractors and trailers. Uh, to your point, um, um, you know, at YRC Worldwide, we have over 60,000 pieces of equipment. We're a heavy asset-based company. Uh, it's hard to uh, replicate that. Uh, as you know, uh, LTL industry has very high barriers to entry with just uh, terminals, trucks, and trailers that's required to uh, run a network like any LTL carrier would do. From our perspective, uh, we, we have a safe fleet, uh, but to maintain older equipment like we've done, uh, we have uh, 77 shop locations, thousands of mechanics uh, across the United States, we're able to do our own warranty work and those nature, but it is more expensive to maintain an older piece of equipment and you just simply can't drive the efficiency uh, that newer equipment brings, such as fuel miles per gallon, the new safety features, uh, automated pieces uh, along those lines. So from that aspect, it does make a great difference as we uh, basically are starting one of the largest uh, implementations of equipment into our networks uh, that we've done in modern times uh, through this $400 million loan package. Uh, we don't plan to expand the fleet through that process. We plan to replace and the efficiencies uh, created from that uh, uh, will benefit uh, our customers, our shareholders, our employees, uh, all the right things happen uh, from equipment. And uh, as you know, Mike, uh, as a student of the industry, there's very low execution risk on that equipment. Uh, once the equipment comes into the network, it is immediately um, um, put into a high utilization category and those efficiencies uh, come with um, a very low execution risk. Okay. Uh, one other thing, it was announced here uh, last week that YRC is expanding its next day service capabilities. And you know, one of the things that I think uh, a lot of people in trying to understand YRC worldwide, don't necessarily understand the interplay between your YRC national, what you know, we view as the long haul carrier, the national carrier. And, you know, a lot of people would say, Darren, and I don't think I'm giving you any news here that the real strength of YRC is in the regional network. So can you just basically share what shippers should expect to see with this focus on next day and how that ties in with, uh, you know, the regional network, et cetera. It's really what makes us unique uh, as a carrier that we've got three best in class regional asset based carriers and then a national network uh, on top of that to support the geography that they don't actually cover. Uh, part of the enterprise transformation that we've been talking about uh, over the last several quarters is just that uh, we have a position in our company now called the Chief Network Officer, and Scott Ware, the former president of Holland, uh, fulfills that role, and it makes perfect sense because Scott has uh, as much line haul and network experience as anybody I know in the industry. And certainly, uh, the efficiencies you create in your network, especially with the, the, the tens of millions of miles that LTL carriers run on a monthly basis, uh, it's crucial that those networks be efficient. So from a regional standpoint, we're incredibly efficient, and the, the long haul carrier, YRC Freight, is on those uh, lengths of hauls uh, over 1,200 miles. Uh, the announcements that's, that's been made recently, it started out with the state of Texas because we don't have regional coverage in the state of Texas. That is a YRC Freight state, and because of YRC Freight's long haul emphasis, we were missing out on a part of the market in the next day and two day piece. Uh, Scott designed velocity centers with his team. We put those in place in Texas and we've been running that uh, for several quarters now very effectively uh, and efficiently and providing uh, excellent service on that next day and two day market through the national carrier YRC Freight just because uh, we know how to do next day regional business naturally with UPenn, Holland, and Redaway. We've got it perfected. We can do the same things in the YRC freight network where those regional carriers aren't present. The most recent one that you mentioned is we put a velocity center in Little Rock, Arkansas, and that allowed YRC freight 
to not only extend the reach of Holland's next day, second day market, but also to put in a next day, second day market for wire sheet freight specifically throughout the Mid-South and then reaching on down into uh, Louisiana and uh, those areas. So that's what enterprise transformation is all about. This other part of enterprise transformation that's important, it's not just about the geographies that the regionals aren't in, the ones that they are in, YRC Freight is there as well. And we've got overlapping coverage and we're able to speed up uh, YRC Freight's customer shipments that ship inside that regional footprint by moving these companies closer together. So uh, our vision there is to maintain all of the brands, but also to give you the best of what every brand offers and to make it um, uh, seamless for the customer so that when you tender a shipment to a YRC Worldwide company, you will get the best service experience that we offer regardless of the brand that it moves on. So <clears throat> just to try and help people understand, I, I, and let me just help me understand if I'm, I'm on the mark here. Uh, you know, the issue that a lot of shippers may not be paying attention to are length of haul issues. So, you know, you mentioned YRC 1200 miles in, in the regional network. Can you give us uh, just an understanding of the differential, uh, di different length of haul factors for YRC in the regional network? For example, what's the average length of haul for like a Holland or a, a new pen? Yeah, we don't break that out for the regional carriers, but I can tell you this, uh, my new pen, for example, uh, their service area in the Northeast, 95% of their business is next day. So that gives you a very good idea okay. of where that falls. Certainly Holland's business, the next day and second day market is crucial for them. That's what built their network. Holland is known for their speed and their excellent service. And that's why that brand is so strong in the Midwest. Now, Redaway is interesting because of the West Coast impact and, and also the vast um, um, uh, geography that uh, the West Coast brings. So Redaway, even though they have a very strong next day and second day footprint, uh, because of the service area that they, uh, and a sparser population uh, that spread out in some of the square states, uh, they have a longer length of haul than probably most people would imagine. So uh, collectively, if you average it across all of our brands, it comes out uh, around 900 miles now that we're reporting uh, as one segment uh, with Wire C Freight, New Penn, Holland, and Redaway. So then what you're basically saying is that by moving the YRC, the national carrier, through some of these velocity centers that are shared by the regional carriers, you can accelerate the, the service factor for YRC. Is that an accurate assessment? Yeah, absolutely. Many of our customers tender even one and two day normal next day and second day freight to YRC freight uh, just because of the size and scale of YRC freight but those customers may not get the level of service that they would get if they tendered that to a regional carrier in that footprint. It's just a, an ease of use. The shipment may not be service sensitive, but naturally, uh, if we've got the capability of moving the shipment faster, then we wanna do that uh, and provide that extra value to the customer, uh, regardless of whether they tender the freight to YRC Freight, Holland, Redaway, or New Penn, we wanna give them the best service experience possible. On the flip side of that, uh, if a shipment is tendered to New Penn up in the Northeast, but its actual destination is Texas, then that still allows a regular New Penn customer to tender and load their either drop trailer or however they like to interchange with New Penn, but also it just opens up the vast network uh, of the entire YRCW portfolio. Okay. Uh, Darren, as we, we close this out, you know, one of the things you have helped open, not just my eyes, but I think the eyes of a lot of shippers, is to help them understand the level of information that the carriers are using in assessing the uh, effectiveness of their relationships with their customers. Uh, that, you know, not just the overall relationship, but in particular, the financial dynamics and how that rolls through to, uh, you know, responses to RFPs and rate quotes and pricing. Uh, do you see that going forward, getting even more refined? And just to kind of clarify that, one of the changes I think that's occurred in the industry, and I, this is based on my conversations with you and some other uh, C-level executives at LTL carriers, 
is that the carriers themselves are looking at the operating ratio data for each individual shipper. And that data is being used to determine what the rate structures are going to be like. So you're, you know, in years past where you had market-based pricing where you might be willing to accept the loss here if it meant revenue here, you guys are looking at each shipper on a standalone basis in assessing, like I said, the profitability, the operating ratio data. Is that a fairly accurate assessment of what's going on on the pricing front in the LTL sector? Yeah, I think you're dead on target with that. And we've discussed it before. Uh, it's no secret. Uh, the, the, the majority of the industry being fully deployed on dimensioners has made that data more reliable. Uh, we all had costing models that did a pretty good job of determining what our internal cost uh, uh, pieces uh, required. But where we were lacking is understanding that full uh, pounds per cubic foot of every shipment moving in the network. Uh, we, we sell a square of empty space, but we were having trouble determining uh, because of the volume of shipments and also, you know, take a regional carrier's experience. Uh, that shipment is not in the network very long. And uh, many times it would take several months to determine what the actual cube was on the shipments that you're moving. And by the time you do that, you might have been in a losing proposition uh, for several weeks or even months. And uh, many times carriers uh, in the past, when we didn't have good information, we would take that as predatory pricing or other things when really it was just happening uh, based on not understanding the full commodity mix of what was entering your network. Uh, those days are, are, are past, thank goodness. And that's, and, and many might say, well, that's bad news for shippers. Uh, no, it's not. <laughs> this, this gives you a predictable plan around your transportation budget. And um, um, many times I've said, you know, hey, I'd like to try being on the other side of this business sometime. But, you know, over the last few years, I don't envy any supply chain manager uh, trying to drive their transportation budget appropriately because this thing has just been a whipsaw of um, uh, slack demand and then uh, capacity being tight back and forth. Um, um, I heard one large shipper talk about, you know, just going from ditch to ditch rather than staying in the middle of the road. And I think the mentioners allow us to stay in the middle of the road, do what's right to provide a great service for a fair price. And uh, it allows shippers to have a predictable plan around their budget uh, by uh, us verifying their information for them. So overall, I don't know of anything more exciting or important impactful that's happened in our industry over the last three to five years to truly modernize how we price uh, shipments. Well, and in that spirit, we, we created a white paper a couple of years ago about you know explaining LTL pricing. Uh, recently, a gentleman hired us, uh, we hired rather a gentleman uh, that was the vice president of pricing for an LTL carrier and it's really kind of helped us refine, you know, taking a look at the operating ratio data. One of the things, Darren, you mentioned a couple of interviews ago is that with dimensionalizers, you can now measure things in inches and with ELDs, you can measure, you know, time down to minutes. And, you know, one of the things that's really kind of opened our eyes when we're trying to uh, help shippers understand sourcing events is, you know, you put out an RFP without looking at what's happening at your dock or the operating requirements you're imposing on your LTL carriers. So, you know, for example, the, the line haul cost is a relatively stable cost, but the cost to pick up shipments and drop off shipments can be all over the place. And now you guys have much better data that will help you assess, you know, the level of rates that you need to compensate you for the effort that's being extended. And uh, I, I, you know, that's something I want to say thank you to you and people like Rob Estes and Mike Cronin and others that have helped us understand that that is an important variable. And uh, do you see more shippers now at least receptive to modifying some of the things that are occurring at their facilities to basically work more closely with the carriers? Is that something that you're seeing by any, uh, you know, major, even smaller shippers? Oh, yes, absolutely. And, you know, with the capacity piece we're in right now, it's a concerted effort among carriers and shippers to do just that. I mean, there's outliers in every situation. We've got certain markets that, you know, we've been inundated in, we're short on labor. We haven't provided the best level of service to those shippers, but they've worked with us because they're uh, struggling just like we are in their distribution centers to have the appropriate staffing levels. And one thing I'm seeing, especially over the last six weeks, Mike, 
that's really a, a hamstring to our network is we've literally got uh, a lot of um, uh, inventory in our network that uh, our customers aren't able to take delivery of. So we've got a lot of trailer capacity being taken up right now from a standpoint, and our customers can't necessarily control that well because they're in various levels of quarantine at large distribution centers and other situations. But when you magnify that across a national network like ours, it translates into <clears throat> on any given day, you know, thousands of trailers being occupied by freight that we can't execute delivery on because that customer cannot receive it or it gets into the distribution center and then the trailer cannot be uh, evacuated timely uh, because uh, of the uh, labor shortage that uh, they're seeing either through a COVID impact uh, or just um, right now being a difficult time to um, uh, hire the, at the levels we all need to. So that's happening right now and it, it flows back into this discussion because detention becomes that, that causes carriers to have to rent trailers and then incur extra costs and uh, the inefficiency in an operation like that. It also gets your uh, equipment pools out of balance which uh, can be terribly expensive for truckload and LTL carriers across the board. So that's the big issue that I'm seeing right now and I don't see any relief in sight, uh, but it's taken a very strong collaboration between us and uh, uh, many large customers out there to try to manage this effectively. So I, I just wanna clarify that because you, I'm really glad you brought that up. We are seeing carriers basically return the freight to the, to the shipper. Is that something that, like you said, you know, I, I had one carrier explain, we can't tie up our docks, you know, holding inventory, you know, we're, we are not a warehouse, okay, yes. we're a trucking company. Uh, and they are in fact, bringing it back to the shipper and charging them for the movement of that freight. And that's why we, you know, the, the TMSs, our constellation and things like that is so important because it can update people on a real time basis about the facilities that the freight's being delivered to so that they don't show up and find there's no one there, or the truck can't get unloaded. Uh, is that something that YRC is also having to do, return the freight to the shipper? Well, you know, we have to seek appropriate disposition on uh, shipments that um, become trapped like that. Uh, but more often than not, uh, what's happening is there's an indefinite delay. And then, you know, there's a frustrating experience for us and for the customer. And the example I would give is most CEOs of uh, carriers, asset-based carriers, they refer to their equipment as revenue-producing equipment. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, we, it's expensive. Uh, we're, we're talking a lot about what we're bringing on, and that equipment is our warehousing space that produces revenue. You know, if, I, if we backed into uh, a warehouse and unloaded large volumes of, of material that uh, that warehouse was not getting paid for they would want disposition on it quickly because that space is valuable to them right. and that's how they um, yeah. protect the livelihoods of their employees we're the same way those trailers you know those 45,000 trailers we've got across our all of our network that's how we produce our livelihood it's crucial that they produce revenue and they not become stationary warehousing space we simply can't afford that and neither can the customers because uh, you know all that translates back into um, uh, blowing your transportation budget if you're on uh, the shipper side so it's a big issue it's one we'll be talking about for several months okay final uh, final two questions uh, Darren uh, your forecast for the remainder of 2020 and on into 2021 uh, how is YRC assessing the transportation marketplace for that period of time yeah, if I could say with certainty about that, Mike, I would be um, uh, on the other side of this interview, uh, you know, at the pro you are. Uh, things are uncertain. Uh, I do see this uh, with what we've just talked about from a capacity standpoint, a hiring standpoint, uh, and the challenges that the entire industry faces around CDL qualified drivers. Uh, I don't see that going away. We're going to all have to work very hard, like we've always done, to bring in enough employees to handle the demand, and also uh, with, the, with the starts and stops that we're seeing from an economic view right now. I think uh, truckload and LTL, uh, that uh, things are tight right now, 
and um, um, because of those dynamics we've talked about, that that likely could stay in place for a while. But as far as predicting, you know, what's happening now, the school starting back, getting employees back to work, um, uh, those type things, um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and we're definitely um, cautious, uh, but but still optimistic. Okay, and then you know, uh, for YRC, Darren, any other you know, as part of your strategic plan that you referenced in our last interview, going forward, what should shippers expect to see beyond factors that we haven't already addressed from YRC going forward? Yes, we're going to take great care of our customers like we always have. I've said over and over, uh, our employees and our customers, that's why we're here. Uh, that's what we're about. Uh, you know, we're, we're over 90 years old. Uh, we're, we're well known. We've got a large share uh, of the overall LTL uh, market share. Uh, we're here for our customers. We'll continue doing that with the runway we've got now. It provides certainty around the company and comfort to those uh, shippers. And um, like I said this on the earnings call, and I just meant it from the bottom of my heart. Uh, so many of our customers, you know, reached out to me after this deal completed. Um, you know, they were just the relief and uh, they were excited about uh, um, the situation around the company moving forward. Uh, when you take what we're going to do from an equipment standpoint, what we're doing from a network standpoint, and our philosophy that's been around for over the nine decades that we've been in business, of just take great care of the customer. That's what we're going to keep doing. That's our focus. Our employees are excited about it, uh, and our customers are too. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward uh, to, to the coming quarters and uh, working collaboratively with uh, all of the supply chain efforts. Just to, uh, it's not going to be boring. It's going to be very exciting, and we're all going to get creative and and uh, efficiencies will abound uh, because they'll be forced uh, with this uncertainty that we're working with right now. So, you know, you, I, you mentioned efficiencies and I, I know I said last question, but uh, <laughs> at the risk of running over a little bit, uh, you know, efficiencies, one of the things we've been saying to shippers when we do these sourcing events on their behalf is to sit down and ask the carriers where they want freight. And then also ask them, you know, where their network doesn't make sense for that freight to be, you know, handled by that carrier. And, and YRC, Darren, going way back, one of the things that you've been fairly consistent about is being very upfront about where the network is really running well and where the network has got some struggles. Uh, does that make sense to continue down that path from a sourcing perspective, asking the carriers where they want freight versus you know, where they should find other carriers to handle freight for those those movements that don't make sense in the network. Does that make sense? It does, Mike, and you keep hitting these really important topics, and this is one we could spend all day on, um, <laughs> because the interesting thing is, in an LTL network, typically you have inherent empty lanes that are present because of the way your freight flow is, the way your network's designed, the way your technology works, and customers get to know those over time, especially certain 3PLs have gotten very good at that, and it helps us uh, reposition equipment and also helps the customer or the third party with some really good rates. Most interestingly, though, over the last 90 days since we, we started, we, we hit the bottom with the COVID drop. And as we've started to see this sequential improvement, uh, I've never seen so many shifts in the actual empty lanes in our network before because there's all these starts and stops with distribution centers and also customer sourcing from areas they don't typically source from. So that's very yeah. dynamic. And this is an opportunity for us. It's an opportunity for uh, everyone on the shipper side to work uh, closely with us and be able to pinpoint these areas quickly and also provide good rates, um, but also that customers have visibility in time to take advantage of those rates. Now there's some work to be done there, but I think it's a great opportunity across LTL networks. But I don't know how long this unpredictable nature is going to last, but I can tell you this, the better we get at, and I, when I talked about those forced efficiencies that uncertain times bring, this is one of them. This is an opportunity for all of us moving forward and to, to analyze, to get visibility of those uh, lanes very quickly, and then to put freight on those um, uh, pieces of equipment to help reposition would be beneficial to everyone. And also it would help with the current capacity 
Yeah, we did an interview, uh, a webinar for CEOs, and uh, I'm a member of Young President's Organization. We did a webinar in May talking about supply chain issues. We had David Simchi leave it from MIT and Harry Moser, the head of the reshoring. And I think one of the things that is definitely going to impact freight flows is uh, Harry runs and founded the Reshoring Institute. And David Simchi Levy, Levy, I also brought up the fact that you're going to see companies restructure their supply chains to mitigate the risk factors. And as a result of this COVID crisis has really kind of opened eyes that the total cost of ownership issues are going to result in some significant changes in freight flows. Uh, one other thing I just want to mention, Darren, that for all of our viewers, uh, when I was interviewed by the Wall Street Journal about YRC, one of the things I mentioned, and I continue to point out, and maybe this is uh, a question you could just uh, just touch on, uh, but one of the things that truly makes YRC unique, and this is something that I mentioned, when you've seen other organizations go through challenging times, you see contentiousness within the organization, uh, where, you know, whether it's the unions, management, lenders, et cetera, you know, one large truckload carrier last year shut down because of an issue with the uh, with the lenders. What made you the YRC situation, from my perspective, genuinely unique, was I've never seen an organization that was more aligned in terms of management, unions, lenders, in driving the the future of the organization. And and that's something that I think goes back not just to you but to James and before that. And I just think that that's something that shippers need to keep in mind is why RC goes forward. Uh, you know, I know that's an easy question, but I think it's an important one. Any thoughts on that? Absolutely, Mike. I think that's uh, um, what's really um, impactful about YRC Worldwide is the transparency we've had with all of our constituents, um, uh, customers, uh, unions, uh, all uh, across the board of our um, uh, labor spectrum, and then also with lenders, and, and most recently, uh, our newest largest shareholder. At the end of the day, um, we're, we're essential to, to the national supply chain. Our employees know that, they're proud of that, and um, uh, they're a resilient group of people. Uh, I've been associated with this company uh, for a very long time. I, I graduated from college on a Saturday and I started uh, at one of our heritage companies the following Monday. Mike, you can, you know, I'm proud of this company. I'm proud of what we're done. We're proud to be a unionized carrier in this industry and also taking great care of the customers is what it's all about, but also keeping those customers informed about what's going on with our companies, not only from a network standpoint, but also from a financial standpoint. And I think our teams across the board have always done a very good job of doing that. And lastly, I would say our people are tough. Uh, they, uh, uh, the, the, those, those times come our way, but I think we handle them well. We handle them with uh, confidence. We handle them with integrity. And that's what we're known for, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm proud to be CEO of a company uh, that I started out as a supervisor at. And uh, it's just a, a great example uh, of the opportunities that are out there in a company like YRC Worldwide. I'm, I'm chuckling, Darren, because when I was interviewed by some financial analysts, and I serve on the board, full disclosure, of a publicly traded truckload carrier, et cetera. But when I was interviewed by these analysts, one of the thoughts I kept coming back to them was, kids, this is not their first time at the rodeo. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. like, this is, they're sitting back, they're going, wow, we've never had to deal with this before. But you have a great future, and uh, with the investment there, looking forward to continuing the dialogue. And I want to say thank you very much, Darren for taking the time to update us on YRC, the LTL marketplace, and look forward to our discussions in the future. Thank you, uh, Mike. Um, and once again, just a shout out to all the YRCW employees. Uh, we're, we're just ordinary uh, folks here, but we've got extraordinary determination and uh, we bring that to our customers every day. So thank you so much for having us. And as I say, nothing takes the place of persistence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely true. Great to see you, Mike. Thanks so much.